Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Building a Kingdom of Love with Monsignor John Essig. Monsignor Essig is a priest of the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He has served as a retreat director and confessor to St. Mother Teresa. He continues to offer direction and retreats for the Sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. Monsignor Esif encountered St. Padre Pio, who became a spiritual father to him. He has lived in areas around the world, serving in the Pontifical Missions, a Catholic organization established by St. John Paul II to bring the good news to the world, especially the poor. He continues to serve as a retreat leader and director to bishops, priests, sisters, and seminarians, and other religious leaders. Building the Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. What's on your heart today, Monsignor? Today is Trinity Sunday. It, it designates our faith in the Father, in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All our prayers are offered to God who is a three-person God. For the Christian, we have belief that God is one in the Mass today, that God of Revelation is so much taught to us as the one whom we believe in. And from the book of Deuteronomy, in the fourth chapter, we read, Moses said to the people, Put this question to the ages that are past, that went before you from the time God created man on earth. Was there ever a word so majestic from one end of the heavens to the other? Was anything ever heard? Did ever a people hear the voice of of the living God, speaking from the heart of the fire as you heard it and remain alive? Has any God ventured to take himself one nation from the midst of another by ordeals, signs, and wonders, war with might and outstretched arm by fearsome terrors, all this that the Lord your God did for you before your eyes in Egypt. Understand this today, therefore, and take it into your hearts. The Lord is God indeed in heaven above and on earth below. He and no other keep his law and commandments as I give them to you today so that you may prosper and live a long life in the land that the Lord your God gives you forever. This little tiny nation in the midst of all of those civilizations comes up with monotheism. Those Egyptians, Greeks, Hindus, Buddhists, all these magnificent civilizations. And what do they come up with? They come up with many gods. And so when you when you hear of the, how could they ever think that the sun was God? How could they ever think that the wind was God? But these, the Jews, gave us the true God, the one God. And we believe that that is who God is. And then Christ comes and he is going to reveal to us the one God is three person God. And he reveals that and he has taught us that I am the God who came down from heaven. And St. Paul in the book of Romans tells us today on the feast, everyone moved by the spirit is the son of God. The spirit 
you receive is not the spirit of slavery bringing fear into your lives again. It is the spirit of sons, and it makes us cry out, Abba, Father, so that when we receive baptism, the Holy Spirit comes into us, and what does it bring us to say? Abba, Father. And in union with Jesus Christ, as we are united with him through baptism, we are now receiving the the Holy Spirit that makes us sons of God, united with Jesus Christ, crying out, Abba, Father, so that you as a baptized Christian and everywhere in the world that this Trinity Sunday is celebrated, whether you're Protestant, Orthodox, or Catholic, we do the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We profess our faith every time you make the sign of the cross, you are declaring that I am a believer in the Holy Trinity. I believe that God is one and that he is a three-person God. When we come to say this, when Jesus taught us how to baptize, because I'm speaking to those now who are Christian and united with Jesus Christ through baptism, what did he tell his disciples to do in Matthew 28? In Matthew 28, beginning with the 16th verse on this Trinity Sunday, in the Mass today, we read, the 11 disciples, because Judas had left apostles now, set out for Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had said that he would meet them. Jesus came up and spoke to them. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, he is the risen Lord now who is about to ascend into heaven. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all the commandments I gave you and know that I am with you always, yes, to the end of time. So when Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, send the Holy Spirit, and they're going to baptize. They immediately went out and they began baptizing. The first ones they baptized were Jews. But then when they began to baptize the Gentiles, a big problem arose. Should they be baptized, and that's a big crisis in the first century, when they baptized the Gentiles, should they be circumcised as the Jews were? A problem arises. And so during this discussion and conflict and back and forth, no, you don't have to be circumcised because baptism is what unites you with Christ and brings you salvation. But that took a while and a lot of conflict and discussion in the early church. The same thing is true. Right after we read these texts, there is in every Mass, wherever you go, whether you're an Orthodox or whether you're a Catholic, we pray a creed that we agree on. Do you know how long it took to make this 325 years for Christians and their leaders to get together at a council called Nicaea? What was the big problem? How can you have three persons in one God? Because many problems arose. Jesus, the son of God, and had a human face, but not really human? Or was Jesus human and not really divine? How could we really have this conflict? How could he be God's son? and become flesh. And how could he, if he took on flesh, be 
human. And so this conflict took a lot of conflict and back and forth, and they came out with the Council of Nicaea. What is our faith? We believe that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and one divine nature. God has one nature. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But when Jesus became a man, he had the divine nature and he took on flesh and he had a complete and total human nature. Those words are very important. Nature is what we share with the others of that species. When he became a man, now listen to the wording of our Nicene Creed. This was written in 325 after long periods of discussion. So when we have this Trinitarian formula for our, yes, we believe in one God, one majestic holy God who is three person. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who is the son of God and the true flesh son of a human. It took another hundred years. And in and, and the Council of Ephesus in 435 to say that he really became the son of Mary and she became the mother of God. That title was given to her. But let's do this for Trinity Sunday. Let's go over, as soon as, this many times is lost at our worship service. But I ask you today on Trinity Sunday to pray this with great faith in what you believe. I believe in one God. This is the creed. And recently the church has changed it from we to I so that I can make it my faith. Do I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible? God created everything that we can see and the invisible world that we cannot see. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Who is the Son of God? He is equal to God, begotten, not made consubstantial with the Father. He is one God, consubstantial with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Now, this is very important. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. This is to testify in this creed that Jesus was truly and fully human. So that when we are baptized into Jesus, he who is a man, who is our savior, unites us to himself. He who is divine becomes human. This is such a powerful statement of our faith. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no 
will end. Right now in heaven, there is a human being, Jesus, at the right hand of the Father. When God was just the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there was no human in heaven. He entered into heaven and broke open heaven for humans. We who are baptized are united with him through baptism. So every person from the year 33, when is baptized, to this year who have died are united with him. They are one with him If in that union. It's their union with him that is heavenly. And we who are on earth have the door of heaven open to us. The door of heaven was closed. We were doomed without him. He is our savior and redeemer. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He's equal to the Father, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. He is the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that to which we have been baptized through the Holy Spirit by water. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. That this world, Jesus is with us, as he promised in the gospel, until the end of time. And we are going to all be united with him forever in heaven. When we say we believe in one God, how often and important it is that we specifically pray to the Father. Which person of the Trinity do you pray to first and most often? And usually people will say, I pray to Jesus. And that's a good prayer. But Jesus always prayed his first prayer to the Father. And that's why Paul says the Holy Spirit was poured into our hearts and cries out, Abba, because by baptism, you are Jesus. I am Jesus. We are united with him. His prayer was always, Abba, Father, Father. And how often in our prayers we neglect the Father. For our prayer and our spiritual lives to grow, we want to grow in union with Christ. So in the Trinity, when we pray, it is first to the Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The first cry that all of us, and when Jesus was asked by his disciples, teach us to pray, what did he say? He said, pray our Father. And many of us, I think, many times pray to Mary or pray to the saints. On this Trinity Sunday, how important it is to pray first to the Trinity, to the Father, to Jesus, and to the Holy Spirit, to honor and worship and glorify the Trinity. If you have a devotion to Mary, and your, your devotion is authentic, Mary didn't even know that God had a son until it was revealed to her. As a Jewess, her primary relationship was with Abba, with the Father. And through her son, the revelation was made that he had this son, and he wanted her to become the mother of that son. And because of that, she became the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Her devotion to the Trinity was the first and the most beautiful. The daughter of the Father, the mother of Jesus, and the spouse of the Spirit. Mary is so much an adorer of the Holy Trinity. 
She is a perfect witness to us of how to pray to the Abba, to the Ibn, to the Son, to the Spirit. And so when we pray, and especially through Mary, and ask her help, airily to the Trinity. Many of us have great devotion to the saints, and sometimes they can be exaggerated. Every saint is a radiation of the Trinitarian life that is within them. Every saint, St. Francis, St. Anthony, whatever saint, St. Pio, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, they're all radiances of the Trinitarian life that was within them. What do we see when we see them? We see Christ, and we see the Father, and we see the Holy Spirit. They were witnesses of who the Trinity is when it emblazons their love and their fire and their radiance in their hearts. Those who are in heaven today, radiating and glorifying the Trinity and witnessing and radiating Christ's life through their lives in all eternity, that same life on earth we have received through our baptism, through our confirmation, and for those of us who are ordained through our ordination, we are living witnesses of the Trinitarian life that radiates through us. And when we receive the Eucharist, it inflames that divine life. And when we receive forgiveness, it does grow even more brilliantly in the life of the church. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. That Trinitarian identity is so essential, isn't it, Monsignor? I mean, do we, I I talk to so many people who they say they pray to God and they ask God for things, but they they miss something if they don't understand that personhood, don't they? Yes, yes. How specifically personal that is, is many times it's like talking to a kind of a, there's a, a window, you talk into it, and you hope somebody in there hears it. They look, they miss the relationship. It's what Paul brings out in today's reading in Romans. If you read that again, and especially pay attention to that at the Eucharistic celebration, it's such a strong teaching because it primarily teaches that prayer is relationship. It's relationship of a child. We We cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself, and our spirit bears united witness that we are children of God. And we are children, we are heirs as well, heirs of of God and co-heirs with Christ, sharing his suffering so as to share his glory. We are in relationship with the Father. The Father and I, just like with Jesus, are one. When I am praying, because of my Trinitarian life, I am in him, and he is in me, and I have a son's relationship with my father. You have a daughter's relationship with your father. And therefore, through that relationship, we have a relationship with one another. Final thought, Monsignor? Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Thank you so much, Monsignor. Wow. Thank you. What a powerful voice you have this morning. Wow. (laughs) I think it's the microphone. I I don't know. I think it's also the spirit there. How wonderful. Thank you. God bless. You've been listening to Building a Kingdom of Love with Monsignor John Issef. 
to hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com And join us next time for Building the Kingdom of Love with Monsignor John Essef.